The Buddha once said that one of the prerequisites for concentration is a sense of comfort, a sense of ease, a sense of well-being. That can be both physical and mental. One of the reasons we chant those chants on goodwill, compassion, appreciation, and equanimity is to create a sense of well-being in the mind. Thoughts of goodwill are good thoughts to think. They feel good. They put the mind at ease. You don't have to struggle with anybody. You don't have to settle any old scores. And you can look at yourself and see that these thoughts are good to think. And that feels good. You're thinking good thoughts. They help put you in the right mood for the meditation. Physically, we work with the breath. First, we work with our posture. You want to sit straight. You don't want to lean over. You don't want to sit hunched over. Try to keep your back straight, comfortably straight. And then there's the breath. Does the breath feel good? Notice where exactly you feel the breath. Which parts of the body have sensations that let you know now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. And how do those sensations feel? Do they Are they tight, restricted? If they are, think of them loosening up a little bit. Or do they get tight at a particular spot in the breath cycle? We may want to shorten the breath or lengthen the breath. Approach this as you would any skill. You learn from your mistakes. One of the first things you learn as you work with the breath is that you're clumsy. You tend to put too much pressure on it. You have too controlling or too tight an attitude towards it. Well, that doesn't mean that you should stop working with the breath. It's like sitting down and playing the piano for the first time. You sit down and you can't play Beethoven. Now, there are two ways of reacting to that. One is to get up and never touch the piano again. Another is to keep playing four minutes and 33 seconds, the one where you just sit at the table, sit at the piano, and don't do anything at all. And the other is to come back and work on it, see what you did wrong. This is how piano playing becomes a skill. This is how any skill gets developed. You explore that region, that boundary line between what you can control and what you can't control. And the way you explore it is by poking here, or adjusting there, knowing that you'll probably make some mistakes, but not getting too worried about it, because you can learn from your mistakes. And over time, you get more and more sensitive to exactly how much is too much control, how much is too little control. And you develop a wide range of techniques. When there's pain in the body, what, what's the best way to breathe? When you're tired, what's the best way to breathe? When you're tense, what's the best way to breathe? These are things you can explore. And the whole point of this is that in the course of doing this, you develop your own sensitivity as to what works and what doesn't work, and your standards for what works and what doesn't work are going to get more refined. This is how discernment gets developed in the practice. It's not a matter of reading a few books, getting a few ideas, and then cloning your mind to those ideas so that you see things the way they're described in the books. That's not discernment. Just adding one more layer of perceptions on top of the layers you've already got. Discernment comes from your ability to see the mind in action. And to be sensitive as to when the mind's actions are giving good results and when they're not. You have to be your own judge. 
In other words, instead of throwing everything on onto the texts or onto the teachers, you take on the job of learning to be a good judge of your actions. And John Fuang used to say that meditators tend to be like little puppies. They go out and they defecate and they come running to their mothers to have the mothers lick them off. They don't learn how to lick themselves off yet. And so what you want to learn how to do as a meditator is learn how to lick yourself off. Things don't go well, learn how to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and then figure out, well, what went wrong? What went right? And you take responsibility for your meditation. You take responsibility for your insights. This is what the Buddha did. This is what every meditator has to do. If you go to a teacher, you have a certain experience, and the teacher says, well, that's this level of John, or that's this level of insight. Can you be sure? Do you really want to hand those judgments over to somebody else? Or do you want to learn how to do it on your own? So you can, tr you can trust yourself. Because if you let the other people do the judging on the one hand, there's always going to be an element of doubt. And then two, it's one way of absolving your yourself of any responsibility. And that's not a good attitude for a meditator to take. You've got to learn to look, try a few things, try what's it like just to let the breath come in and out on its own? What is it going to do? How to watch it, how to nudge it, what to think in order to make it more comfortable. And then how to judge the results when they come. This is how it becomes a skill. And as it becomes more and more of a skill, you become more sensitive to even the slightest bit of discomfort, both in the body and in the mind. And that's how you see the Four Noble Truths. You see stress. You see how it's caused. You connect it to your own actions. And you see what you do or what you don't do that lets the stress just be shed away. So think of the meditation as an experiment, something you try. And as with any, any scientist, the scientists like to see their hypothesis proved, but they're willing to admit the times when the hypothesis is not proved, proven, when the experiment actually proves something else. You chalk it up to experience and you try again. As I was mentioning today, the instructions for breath meditation they involve discerning and they also involve training yourself, like training in any skill. You need desire, you need the desire to actually do the practice. And you're up, you're open and above board about that. Don't try to deny the fact that there's desire there. It's just you learn how to use it skillfully. Then there's persistence. You stick with it. Try it again and again and again. And it's not just the hours you put in. You're also intent. Pay very careful attention to what you're doing, what the results are. And then there's a quality that basically it's intelligence, which involves using your ingenuity. And then being discerning and what works and what doesn't work. These qualities, and the four of them are called the basis for success. They're essential to any skill. And so approach this as a skill. Remember how you 
learned skills in the past, if it was music or art, a sport, carpentry, whatever. How did you go about mastering that skill? A lot of times you made mistakes, and you noticed that there were mistakes, and you didn't give up. You went back and tried it over again, trying to observe to see what you did wrong, what you did right. what worked and what didn't work. And over time, your hands, which seem to be all thumbs, suddenly become human hands. And there comes a point where you don't have to go running to somebody else to pass judgment on whether you did it right or not. You began to know yourself whether it's right or not. That's when you've really mastered the skill. And the same principle applies to the breath. We spend so much of our lives being desensitized to the breath energy in the body, to how we actually feel the body from within, because we're so intent on learning other things that we've got to block out this part of our awareness. Now's the time to back up and get more sensitive to this area of your awareness again. see how it feels, to see how your perceptions of what the breath does are going to affect how the breath actually flows through the body, and how you can work both with the breath and with the perceptions to make it more comfortable. So you've got that prerequisite for the mind to settle down and get concentrated, a sense of ease, a sense of well-being. And the body sitting here seems to have a nice flow of energy through it. It's not blocked. The blood seems to be flowing through all parts of the body. And it feels good just sitting here. And the amount of pressure you put on the present moment is just right, not too loose, not too heavy. That's something that comes with practice. So pay careful attention to what you're doing, because that's how you learn. And that's how the meditation becomes yours. <laughs>